Hello, students, and welcome back. If you'll remember, in our last class, we discussed the value of history as a tool for understanding and improving public health. Hopefully, as a result of our discussions, you've come to see that studying the past gives us a broader perspective on public health, one that emphasizes its social, cultural, political, and economic dimensions. In other words, Public health is not just about biological phenomena like germs or viruses. It's not just about epidemiological data like morbidity and mortality statistics. And it's not just about the impact that preventative measures like quarantine have on the incidence or prevalence of infectious disease. To be sure, public health certainly encompasses these things, but it is also much more than them. Taking an historical approach to public health, first and foremost, helps us talk about the causes of public health policies. In any particular era, we can ask, what were the social and economic ideas that informed disease control efforts? What was the ideological context within which campaigns for health unfolded? And how did broader political, social, economic, and cultural factors shape the way authorities went about trying to prevent the spread of a particular disease. And then, when talking about consequences, we focus not only on how public health impacts disease patterns, but also about how this impacts things like the governance of people, their movement, and their conduct, how it impacts state formation, nationalism, concepts of citizenship, etc., Having established that history has much to offer public health, in this lecture I want to build on that point. Because it is not enough to say that historical approaches to public health are valid and instructive. A huge part of the reason for this is that on a very profound, fundamental level, public health itself is an historical discipline. This might seem a strange thing to say because, after all, public health experts are generally preoccupied with the present, but bear in mind that the past is a place full of diseases and that very few of them have been completely eliminated. With the exception of a few notable maladies, we are generally struggling with the same germs and viruses that afflicted our ancestors. As such, the only way that public health can ascertain the impact of specific diseases on human populations is by studying these over a long time span. That makes public health history. In order to get into this a bit more, in what follows, I'd like to look at how historical writing about public health has changed over the years. Before we get to talking about any specific events in the history of public health, I first want to spend a little bit of time talking about historians, about the ways they've approached this subject, about the specific topics they've explored, and about the kinds of scholarship they've produced. In other words, what we're going to be doing in this lecture is exploring the historiography of public health. Historiography is the study of the way history is written. When we do historiography, we're not studying the events of the past. Instead, we're looking at how individual historians have interpreted those events. And we're looking at trends in the scholarship in an attempt to answer some basic questions, like first, when did the field known as history of public health first emerge, and for what reasons? How has the field changed over the years, and what has propelled those changes? And third, What's the current state of the field, and what kinds of questions should historians of public health be devoting themselves to right now? Our story of the intimate relationship between public health and history begins in the late 18th century. It was at this time that the field known as epidemiology first emerged, and from the very beginning, it was historically oriented. In fact, in Berlin and Vienna, whose medical colleges offered some of the earliest instruction in epidemiology, courses frequently had titles like History of Medicine and Epidemiology. History was used to contribute practical knowledge to the new field of epidemiology, and textbook accounts often featured sections with titles like, quote, 
Historico-Geographic Pathology. History here served a kind of contributory function. The goal was to create a permanent record of successes that could be used to establish the legitimacy of this new field of epidemiology. These trends continued into the 19th century, when a number of public health specialists published books recounting the history of their own field. This kind of practitioner history was often undertaken to justify the author's own ideas. A prominent example is a book called English Sanitary Institutions, which was published in 1890 by John Simon, the first chief medical officer of the United Kingdom. Simon's book celebrates the creation of public health in Britain, and it was written so as to argue for the need to recognize this field as an important area of public service, one that the British government should institutionalize and support financially. Telling a story of scientific breakthroughs and continual progress over infectious disease Simon believed that public health was an unmitigated good, one that would usher in a utopian age of mass health. This style of historical writing continued through the first half of the 20th century, and can also be seen in triumphal accounts like Charles Winslow's 1943 book, The Conquest of Epidemic Disease. Similarly celebrating past achievements, Winslow's key theme is the slow but inevitable victory of science and reason over superstition and ignorance. Incredibly optimistic, Winslow's book heaped praise on earlier public health experts whose ideas and activities were presented as altruistic, noble, and forward-thinking. Similar themes can be found in George Rosen's The History of Public Health from 1958. This is also a comprehensive celebratory account. It narrates a history of progressive triumph over mass illness. Rosen believed that the journey from antiquity to the present was one in which Western countries slowly but surely succeeded in improving the health of their populations, reducing mortality rates, and decreasing the incidence of infectious disease. While practitioner histories like these advanced the study of public health in a very important way, they were also quite problematic. The assumption underlying these accounts is that public health was a universal net good, and that any attempt to improve the human condition was to be celebrated. Public health experts here are presented as heroes, and those who opposed their efforts were villains, stupid, lazy, corrupt, or resistant to change. Their opposition was seen to be the only obstacle obstructing the path to a health paradise. Questions about the way that uh, economic circumstances affected one's access to health were generally ignored and no one considered how other variables like race, gender, or culture might similarly limit access to health. In fact, the role of the public in public health was entirely overlooked, as the focus was on ideas and policies, not on the way these actually impacted populations. To the extent that sick people entered these stories, they did so only as aggregate statistics of mortality and morbidity not as flesh-and-blood individuals. Only in the 1960s and 70s did historians begin to talk about the actual biological experiences of people. During these decades, the scholarship changed rather dramatically. Instead of just looking at how sanitary reforms and other disease control efforts impacted mortality and morbidity rates, historians began to consider how public health impacted the development of society more generally. Looking at, for example, how different groups in society experienced epidemics, they began to see that governmental responses to these were influenced by a whole host of economic, social, political, and ideological factors. This trend continued into the 1970s, 
As historians looked at how disease outbreaks shaped the social relation between classes, how they factored into state formation, and the role that they played in processes of colonization and imperialism. And then came AIDS. In the early 1980s, this new pandemic stimulated fresh debates about the place of infectious disease in modern life. Prior to the global spread of HIV, most people were convinced that epidemics were a thing of the past. AIDS shattered this belief. Moreover, in response to the discrimination and hostility that many people living with AIDS confronted, historians began to ask new questions about public health, including questions about stigma, about cultural representations of illness, and about the body. On top of this, medicine's complete helplessness in the face of the AIDS pandemic led to a rejection of the heroic accounts of public health penned in the 1950s. Newly pessimistic about humanity's ability to successfully grapple with infectious disease, historians began to apply the insights of Michel Foucault, the French scholar whose work challenged the idea that the Enlightenment led to a more rational, progressive, scientific approach to public health. According to Foucault, the ultimate object of disease control was not simply the reduction of mortality and morbidity rates, but, more importantly, the creation of new norms and standards of personal conduct, a disciplinary culture designed to exert control over the citizenry. Grappling with these insights, historians looked anew at 19th century Europe's experience with cholera. Looking to understand the relationship between disease, public health, and class relations, studies of cholera convinced many historians that public health was not always the unalloyed social good it had been traditionally presented as. Looking at how governmental cholera management strategies adversely impacted the lives of the working poor, for example, it seemed that public health might just be another form of social control. In making these arguments, public health historians found much evidence for Foucault's claims, and they came to see that public health was often less about disease control than about the subtle manipulation of people's lives. Whereas practitioner histories never questioned the motives of public health workers, now this was happening all the time. From a Foucauldian perspective, it appeared that things were getting worse, not better. By the 1990s, it was clear that the grand narrative of progress seen in the works of Winslow and Rosen were out of fashion. No longer is the story of public health about humanity's emancipation from the forces of sickness and death. No longer was public health to be celebrated as an unproblematic force for good. The old model, in which public health was seen as a blessing bestowed by the state on the wretched, filthy masses, has been overthrown, as now historians realize that public health campaigns often work to stigmatize marginalized populations and to perpetuate the structural inequalities that undermine their health. To this day, these trends continue. Today, the history of public health is about the social, economic, and political relations of health, about the interactions of people in different classes, of citizens and states, and of organizations and experts. It is about collective social action undertaken in the name of health, about the operation of power, and about the political aspects of population health. It entails an examination of the rise of the modern state, and in particular, the state's organization of medical services. It asks about the ideologies that have figured into the rise and development of public health as a governmental project, and about the social, cultural, and economic consequences of the state's health-related interventions. All right, well, that's all we've got time for today. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and that you found it informative. Thanks for watching and listening. Once you've had a chance to think things over, please proceed to our discussion board and share your thoughts on these questions. I'm looking forward to seeing what you have to say about public health historiography. Until then, be safe and be well.